Journal, a large newsletter publisher, where she ran several business units, including business, investment, and health newsletters. Margie graduated from Dartmouth College with a BA in English and got her master's in journalism from American University. She serves on multiple boards, including for the Clay Boothus Policy Institute, and was named the CBLPI Woman of the Year in 2005. Ladies, please join me in welcoming Margie Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arissa, for that lovely introduction. I appreciate that. And I'm delighted to be here. It's great to see so many um, strong, smart, confident, competent young ladies in the audience filling the room. It uh, gives me hope for the future of the country. And um, I guess that's part of what I want to talk to you about today. Um, the future of the country, and the important role that uh, we, I mean everyone in this room, um, has to play. And um, hopefully I'll be able to give you some food for thought on how to navigate the world of politics and publishing and career and family um, successfully. And we'll talk a little bit about that word, success, and what it might actually mean in the context of your family and your future. Uh, first, I'll explain a little bit about uh, how I came to be standing here today in front of you, purporting to know something about success and family and uh, the future of the country. As you heard, I'm Margie Ross. I'm the president and publisher of Regnery Publishing. Um, we've been publishing conservative books for 70 years. The uh, company was founded in Chicago in 1947. So next year we'll celebrate our 40th, I mean our 70th uh, anniversary. And um, it was founded by a man named Henry Regnery. And he started by publishing some of the seminal works of the early conservative movement. He published William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale, uh, published Whitaker Chambers' Witness, published Russell Kirk's The Conservative Mind, all of which we still have in print and sell today, um, which also maybe gives you a little bit of uh, hope for the future of the country. Um, in, uh, in the mid-'80s, the company was moved to D.C., taken over by Henry Regnery's son, Al Regnery. And um, the, uh, the company flourished and uh, under Al's leadership for 20 years. And um, then I was fortunate enough uh, to join the company in, uh, in 99 and take over uh, the reins when Al Regnery uh, retired from that job. Um, in 2014, Regnery was purchased by Salem Media Group, which, um, as some of you may know, is the country's largest um, provider of radio and publishing content to the conservative and Christian markets. Um, they own 100-plus 100, 100 radio stations across the country and syndicate a lot of the biggest conservative talk shows that uh, we all listen to. Um, and... As you heard, since, uh, since I joined Regnery uh, 17 years ago, I've had the privilege of working with and publishing virtually everyone that you, uh, you've heard of in the conservative landscape. Uh, we've published um, pretty much all of the uh, major conservative writers and pundits, Ann Coulter, Michelle Malkin, David Limbaugh, Dinesh D'Souza, um, Laura Ingram, Mark Levin, Mark Stein, David Horowitz, um, Ed Klein, even Donald Trump. And um, the brilliant strategic work of my team that has led to um, us having 70 plus books on the New York Times bestseller list in the past 17 years. Um, but frankly, just as important as being very good at what we do is having very good timing. And uh, it's important to note that um, since I joined the company in 1999, that was sort of a tipping point for conservative media. And there were a lot of things that were just beginning to bubble to the surface. It was really very early days for Rush Limbaugh, for Fox News, 
for the Drudge Report and for most of conservative talk radio really started taking off at the very end of um, uh, 1997, 89, and, and picking up steam ever since. And what, what we did at Regnery were, was to try to leverage all of those great media platforms and all of those um, great outlets for conservative thought that had been um, really not available to American consumers for, for 20 or 30 or 40 years. Um, and helped us, of course, reach a much bigger audience than conservative publishers had been able to reach before. And, um, and what that meant for us was not just selling uh, or putting you know, 11 books um, at number one on the New York Times list, but also selling literally millions of copies of conservative books and, um, and really being able to have a, uh, an impact on, on the culture and on the dialogue in the country. Um, and I tell you all this not to, um, not to blow our own horn, but to remind you that a book publisher, especially a successful book publisher, um, is like a megaphone. We, our job is to ensure that authors like Ann Coulter and Michelle Malkin can leverage the already big platform they have um, to really reach an even bigger audience and to make a lasting impact on the lives of millions of Americans. And the other part of my job, which is just as much fun, is helping lesser-known authors get a start and helping them reach um, people and have an impact um, far beyond what they could do on their own. Um, and, you know, when you, when you hold a megaphone, you have, in my opinion, a special responsibility. Um, I am, was reminded recently um, when I saw an anniversary of 9-11 of an iconic megaphone moment. I don't know if you have seen the video or seen the photograph of George W. Bush on, at the, at the uh, site of the, uh, of the World Trade Center holding that megaphone. And, and if you remember, it's really interesting because what he said was, I can hear you. And I thought, how interesting. You know, here's somebody with a megaphone who says, I can hear you. And that, uh, I think that showed he understood that when you have a megaphone, um, you also need to be a good listener. So that's part of what I try to do as publisher of Regnery and um, working with so many of the brightest and most outspoken commentators and pundits on the right. Um, I've learned some interesting things about, um, about politics and business, about what is effective and what is ephemeral, and about the many, many faces of success. You know, as I was preparing uh, my notes, preparing this speech, I, I thought about what makes Regnery successful and how some of those lessons might be uh, helpful and meaningful to you. So, um, but I also started to think about some of the lessons that I've learned from the female authors and businesswomen that I've had the privilege to work with and how their approach to work and to life has shaped my own definition of success. So I'm going to start um, with uh, by taking a, a minute or two to share with you um, th the three probably most relevant keys to success um, from my work as publisher at Regnery. There are three things we do um, that are really critical, in my opinion, and that explain why we've been so successful in publishing. And um, I believe that these things are, are relevant well beyond just the book publishing world. So the first rule of successful publishing, and I, was, I would suggest to you that this is the first rule of all successful communication. Um, useful when you are promoting an event on your campus, when you are working on your school paper, when you are deciding what to put on the website of your organization. Um, first rule, start with this question. Who is this for and why do they care? 
That's the question I ask every single author when they come into my office to try to convince me to publish their book. Who is this for and why do they care? Um, and I can tell you that when authors, and some do, say to me, it's for everybody, I say, no, that's, that's, the, that's the wrong answer. Uh, because in my opinion, um, nothing is for everyone. And, and probably more importantly, if you don't have a good picture in your mind of who you're talking to, um, it's very hard to craft an effective message. Um, so think about who it is that you want to reach. Who is sort of the center of the bullseye of your target audience and talk to them. And, um, and, and in my opinion, in my experience, the most successful books and the biggest books start by thinking about the center of the bullseye, the core market, and go out from there. Um, and second rule, and this is very related to the first, is don't try to be all things to all people. Figure out what you're good at and stick to your knitting. Uh, we've been doing that at Regnery for 70 years. We have become very good at it. And I often tell people, well, good Lord, after 70 years, if we're not good at it, we obviously need to be doing something else. Um, but I am often um, surprised when I meet people in the book publishing world. And um, I, I attend a variety of you know book publishing conventions and conferences and meet people. And there are thousands of book publishing companies out there. Oftentimes I'll meet someone and I've never heard of their company and I say, oh, what kind of books do you publish? And um, my favorite bad answer is, we publish a little bit of everything. And I always want to say, why do you do that? That doesn't seem like a good idea because really trying to be good at everything at the same time is usually a recipe for being not very good at anything. Um, so that's our second rule of success. Um, Third rule of success for us is what I like, I like to put it this way, hunt where the ducks are. There is a, uh, a famous book, a famous author named Thomas Stanley. He wrote a book called The Millionaire Next Door. It's a very interesting and very successful book about marketing. And um, he, he wrote a number of books about marketing and salesmanship. And he has this great story. Um, and the story goes like this. So there was a convention of duck hunters, and um, they were all gathered together for this convention. And um, in the evening, at the end of the, the first day, a whole bunch of duck hunters were sitting in the lobby of the hotel, having a drink, chair, swapping stories. And all of a sudden, they noticed that, that one of the guys at the convention, who hadn't been with them, is walking through the lobby, and he's this giant bag of ducks. And they said, Good Lord, Jim, where have you been? And he said, while you were hanging out with the other duck hunters, I was hanging out with the ducks. Um, and, and really the lesson is, if you want to reach people, you have to spend time with them. If you want to communicate successfully with the group, you have to um, spend time with them and understand how they talk, how they think. You, um, you're going to be probably the most successful in talking to people who are like you. And the more time you spend with them and really understand what they care about, what they worry about, um, what they're interested in, the more successful you will be at communicating. So those are three um, really core principles um, that we apply at, uh, at Regnery Publishing, and they're not really publishing rules at all. Um, they're really um, principles of good communication, and, um, and I think you can put them to use in a variety of ways in, in many parts of your life. So what about this promise I made to you in the title of my speech to give you seven surprising secrets from female authors? All right, here we go. Um, these are lessons and insights that are, in my experience, uh, uniquely well understood and embraced by women. Um, and I want to share them with you for two reasons. First, in my opinion, they reveal how women approach life. But second, I think these secrets are relevant to much more than book publishing or conservative politics, the two worlds in which I live and work. 
They are applicable to most professions and probably even more important, um, they're relevant to many, many facets of your life. Um, so thank you. That was beautiful, Danielle. It's just <laughs> perfect timing. Um, first, um, in my experience, one of the most interesting differences between the way um, women work successfully and the way men work successfully is the way in which women build relationships. And you obviously have seen this firsthand already, and you've talked about it a lot yesterday and today, um, the idea about building relationships. I think women um, understand the value of relationships. We seek them out. We worry about them. We nurture them. Um, most of the uh, women that I do books with um, are very interested in doing a multiple book contract, just as an example. It's a small thing, but it's very interesting. They want to build a long-term relationship with their publisher because they understand that over time, as we understand each other better, as we work together more and more, the results will be better and the success will be bigger. Um, and so they're not looking for that sort of short-term you know, one night stand with their book publisher, they're looking for a long-term relationship. And, um, and this is true in so many aspects of the professional world that I have seen. Um, I think in some ways there, it, it explains the difference between how women approach building relationships at work and in their communities. Um, and it also is one of the ways I think that women are uniquely qualified to be communicators because they're communicating based on relationships that we've built. Um, we, uh, we published a book a number of years ago by a, a very smart uh, doctor named Dr. Miriam Grossman, um, who Michelle worked with as well. And she talked about the very real differences um, between the female brain and the male brain, even in utero and how the chemical and biological differences um, literally caused women to seek and nurture relationships in ways that were totally foreign to men. And my experience is that relationships, good relationships, are really key to success in business. And, and one of the important things that I have learned is that um, investing in a relationship is a long-term investment. Um, even if you cannot think of the reason why this investment, this relationship might benefit you in the short term, I think women uh, seek out relationships and understand that um, building relationships can pay off in all sorts of unexpected, unintended, unforeseeable ways over the long term. And I think that's... Um, that's why women are particularly good at it. I, I, I think of almost I think of it almost like um, working in your garden, where you're planting the seeds, you're nurturing, and um, and you you may not even know what's going to grow there, but eventually it really will bloom and blossom and um, and be something that gives you joy. Second thing that I have learned from so many of the female authors that I have worked with is um, that women like to communicate. Now, I know it's a popular cliche to say that women like to talk. And it's usually men who say that, of course. And, and I guess it's true, but it's not the whole story. My husband teases me that there's a girl version and a boy version of every story. And I, of course, I like to tell the girl version because the boy version is not as fun. But, um, but let's not forget, men like to talk, too. Um, men like to hear themselves talk three hours every day on the radio. Lots of men. Um, they're very good at that. Um, so I don't really buy the myth that women like to talk more than men. I think the difference is women like to have conversations. Um, we like to talk with other women. Um, think about the book club model. You know, most book clubs are, a huge percentage of book clubs are made up of women who get together to talk about books or 
whatever else they want to talk about. Um, but publishers see this all the time. And women use talk to build relationships. So these the two things are um, intricately intertwined. Because I think we understand that communication, not talking, but having a conversation, builds rapport. And when I think about the a lot of the female authors that I have worked with, even when they give a speech, I realize I am talking to you now, um, and, and when women give a speech, they're also really... Um, you, I think you will find inviting input. They were inviting a dialogue. They, they're um, very much more comfortable in encouraging that sort of two-way dialogue. Um, we have another book author that, uh, that I've worked with for many years um, named Meg Meeker. She's a, a best-selling author, a pediatrician. Um, she's a great example of this. She's touched hundreds of thousands of lives with her uh, best-selling book that we published a number of years ago called Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters. Um, and she also has a, a radio show with uh, Dr. Dobson. She uh, is very involved with Dave Ramsey and uh, speaks at his smart conferences. Um, she has an amazing uh, part of her career with uh, mentoring young men in the NFL. And throughout all of this, she is quite clearly in those three examples, oftentimes the only woman in the room, and yet they bring her in because she has done such a wonderful job of communicating and listening as well as talking and building, um, building that rapport. So I encourage you to, to follow that example and to think about that. Um, I think the third thing that has struck me about many, many of the female authors that I have worked with is that I think women are reflexively uh, repelled by corruption. I think it offends us. I think um, women object to corruption in a way that maybe men um, are not. It's certainly not to say that, that there are plenty of men who, um, who aren't also opposed to it. But I think of a lot of the uh, most outspoken female authors that I have worked with, and one of the, one of the common themes is speaking out against corruption. Um, Michelle mentioned um, one of my favorite female authors, Michelle Malkin, who, um, who's really made a career at, uh, at pointing out and calling out corruption. Um, we've done many books with her, um, including uh, the most successful book that she uh, that she's written, which was a number one New York Times bestseller, and it was called Culture of Corruption. And um, if you if you have ever heard her speak, you know that uh, that she, her career has been about exposing corruption. She believes passionately that politicians and all of us voting for politicians should be held accountable for what we do. She pulls no punches. Um, and she'll take anyone to task if she thinks they've sold out on, uh, or compromised their principles. And I'm sure her daughters are quite clear on that as well. Um, you know, and by the way, it's interesting to me because I think she makes um, quite an interesting contrast with a certain woman who's now running for president, um, at least for the Democratic nomination of president, um, I believe that that individual is a, is a striking exception to this rule, and maybe that's why she seems so unfeminine to us. It's one of the reasons. Um, secret number four. Women look for the win-win solution. I do a lot of negotiating in my job. I have to negotiate with agents, with authors, with lawyers. And, um, and it's very interesting the approach I see that women take in negotiation versus the approach that men take. Um, and I don't mean to suggest that women don't like to win. I like to win. I think most of the women I have worked with like to win. But I think the difference is um, women, I think, are, want to win, but they're less interested in beating someone else. They want to feel successful. We all want to feel successful, but it's not about um, feeling successful because someone else lost. Um, 
I know you've heard me talk about the, uh, the sort of success breeds success culture, and I found that to be true um, with the women that I have worked with and the most successful women that I have worked with and the authors that I have worked with, the agents that I have worked with, who, when they're negotiating, are looking for a solution or a deal where everyone feels like they want. And, um, and that is possible. And in fact, it's, the, it's one of the foundations for a really successful relationship. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's something in my experience that is uh, a big difference between the way a lot of men like to negotiate and the way women like to negotiate. I've also noticed, um, as I've worked with a lot of very successful women, that women know that little things matter. And I have the privilege of working with a, uh, a wonderful colleague as we um, have embarked on a relatively new venture at Regnery, launching um, a line of children's books called Ch uh, Regnery Kids. And um, the, uh, my colleague is a very, very talented um, children's author and illustrator. Um, and, but one of the things that she's reminded me is um, that the little things matter. Now, I don't mean to suggest that we don't think about the big picture, because I think we do. But, um, but at the same time, we are very often able to juggle both the big picture and the details. And in my experience, um, the women that I have worked with, especially the successful women, can um, keep track of the details at, while also understanding the big picture. And that's a tough thing for men to do. Um, another thing that the s truly successful women that I have worked with um, understand is that service is strength. It's very interesting because um, this is a very tough thing in my experience for men to do. Um, I'll tell you a story about my early career, my very first job. I worked for a small public relations firm that was owned by a woman. She had started it, she ran it, she was a wonderful entrepreneur, a great role model, and um, she had a lot of very um, wealthy, very powerful clients. They were all men, all. Um, this was in the uh, early 80s, and she was working in Washington, D.C., in construction and real estate and development and commercial property. There were no women in this um, field at all. And all, so all of her clients were men. And she was able to um, get their trust, their respect. She was a really valued advisor to them on business and communications as a woman. And I remember, um, some of you may have heard me tell this story. I remember when um, I went to one of the first functions that we were hosting for one of these clients. And um, it was a press event. And so it was a chance to publicize a project that one of these clients was, was about to unveil. And um, this was a very well-known uh, developer, the CEO of a very large development company in Washington, DC. And um, he was there, and the media was all fluttering around. And my boss, who was the president of the company, came up beside him, and she um, and he didn't, he was juggling his drink and his jacket, and she took his jacket, and she took his drink, and she said, oh, let me take those for you. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, wow, this is really seems like the wrong positioning for her. She's, she's um, you know, lowering herself to seem like she's just a, a you know, a lowly assistant. Um, and um, it was, that was totally wrong. I... Um, <laughs> I realized later that by making him successful and by being there when he needed her, she was one of his most trusted advisors. And he listened to her advice. He did not treat her as if she were, you know, someone who was just there to hold his drink. She was standing next to him, giving him advice whispering into his ear as to who this reporter was, which publication this journalist was from, and guiding him so that he came to rely on her for all of his um, media affairs and media relations. Um, and it just was a great lesson to me that um, you can become 
indispensable. You can become extremely powerful and influential um, by remembering that supporting other people is another route, is an important part of being successful yourself. Um, I, um, I also learned this later in my life um, on my own. And I, I tell this to my daughters all the time, that um, as, as many of you may know, um, I lost my husband um, 10 years ago this month. And um, I had three young daughters. I was working. It was, um, a, as you can imagine, a, um, a shocking thing and a very difficult thing. Um, and one of the things that helped me, perhaps the one of the most important things that helped me recover from that was volunteering. <laughs> I, I didn't do it consciously or, um, or strategically, um, but I was drawn to um, helping others as a way to help myself. And it was just another reminder to me that um, we get stronger when we help other people. Uh, seventh surprising secret, or maybe not so surprising, that I have learned from the, uh, the women that I have worked with is that women are fearless defenders of those we love. Um, we've been taught that men are our protectors, and that's true. Men are, as a rule, physically bigger and stronger than women, and I don't have a problem with that. Um, and by the way, I don't want the really confused ones in my bathroom, but that's a different speech for a different day. Um, but even though men are bigger and stronger, we know that women are fearless when it comes to protecting our children and the people and the principles we hold dear. Um, there are many, many fearless young women in this room. Um, and I've seen this firsthand. Um, some of the bravest authors I know, probably the bravest authors I know, are all women. Ann Coulter, Sarah Palin, Stacey Dash. These women had to fight harder. They had to withstand withering personal attacks. They had to be utterly fearless in defense of their principles and their families. We honor, thankfully, we still honor many forms of courage in this country. So let's not forget the courage of the embattled mother. Here's the thing. Men and women are different, which is why conservative women are the real feminists and why Gloria Steinem has given feminism a bad name. Feminists, I'm sure you know this, they brainwashed a whole generation of women into thinking that success meant being an unwoman. That basically, the more you were like a man, the more successful you would be. It's completely wrong. Um, the things we've discussed today uh, are just some of the reasons to celebrate the difference between men and women. Not because we're better, just because we're not the same. To my mind, there's no better example of true feminism than Margaret Thatcher, which is one of the reasons I wanted you to have this book. She showed how to lead, how to inspire, how to change the world as only a woman could. You know, one of my favorite Margaret Thatcher quotes says it quite nicely. If you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. So if I had to sum up what I've learned from conservative authors and businesswomen that I've had the privilege to work with over the years, um, it might be best said like this. Value and nurture the relationships you have. And if you want others to trust and support you, be trustworthy and be supportive. So when you leave here, go back to your schools and your friends and your families. Here's my advice. Embrace the success breeds success. 
mindset. Help others be successful and you will be more successful and more happy. Nurture relationships. Remember, they're um, a long-term investment and, um, and they will pay rewards for years, for your lifetime, if you do so. When you feel depressed, help someone else. It's the single best way to cheer yourself up and to do something good. Reject corruption wherever you find it. Demand integrity, respect integrity, live a life of integrity. Remember that it doesn't necessarily start with you, but it might end with you. And here's what I mean by that. Um, when my daughters were young at school, somebody would be mean to them. Somebody wouldn't talk to them in the hallway. She didn't look at me when she passed me in the hallway. Um, or they didn't get invited to something. I would tell my daughters, you know what you're going to find? Um, you're going to find out that this had everything to do with them and very little to do with you. And they learned over time that that was true, and they would come home and tell me stories. I found out that her dog died. That was the reason she was so upset and didn't talk to me. And it's true. So just keep that in mind, that, um, that uh, many things don't start with you, but you can make them better, even if they didn't start with you. Um, and finally, we end with Donald Trump. Um, because, you know, he's always talking about winning. And I don't know if he will win the election or the nomination or even the next, the next primary. Um, but I, what I do know is a rule that I believe all great women should try to follow. And that is, don't chase success and leave happiness behind. All right, actually, I... I can't end with Donald Trump. Um, so I'm going to end with my idea of a great leader. I'm going to end with another one of my favorite Margaret Thatcher quotes. The wisdom of Margaret Thatcher, who reminded us, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions. I'll take questions if anyone has questions about anything. <laughs> Authors or books or publishing. Yes. My question is, what do you think your biggest trial was facing as coming up in, in the world, like as far as like your, the business world, being a woman? That's a good question because um, when I started um, in my career, there were, um, you know, I ended up in a lot of uh, boardrooms. I ended up in a lot of meetings where I was the only woman. And um, my, my approach to that was simply to be competent, really. I think competence goes a long way, and I think if you – are good at what you do, um, that will actually be rewarded. You, I'm not saying it will always be rewarded, but it will be rewarded by the people in the end that you will that you value and respect. Um, I did not um, ever have to play the woman card um, or complain about treatment that I got. I always depended on simply trying to be as good at my job as I could be and to work as hard as I could. Um, I think, you know, another thing that I have noticed is that women are much better at juggling multiple projects and multiple jobs. That's something that I certainly did um, and have done throughout my career. And um, in the end, if you um, are competent and work hard, people begin to rely on you. Even if they don't want to, they do, because they know you'll get the job done. And that's, uh, that's the best way to be successful. Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, so my question has a tiny bit of background. Before I came on this trip, I had a teacher emailing me and saying that because I was going to be missing a test, a lot of her students were 
pushing her around, asking if they could get the test suggested. And she replied, I told her, I'm so sorry that happened. I never intended for that. And she replied, it's because I'm a woman and I'm new. <laughs> and I, I didn't know what to say back. I didn't reply. But do you think that the people think they can push this around because we are women? And how do we avoid that? And how do I tell that teacher that it's not because she's a woman? <laughs> That's so interesting. Has anyone else? I'm sure, I've heard the story before where people are um, punished um, for coming here. They're not given time off for coming to a conservative event when other, you know, similar liberal or um, leftist or Democrat events, they're given time off. Um, but I've never heard um, a teacher ask for your <laughs> for your help and your advice, especially if um, if she said that she's a woman. But um, but I I have not heard that story before. And um, was she? So what did she tell you about the test? Did she tell you that you could miss it, or did she? Was she? She, she decide? won't let me take it at all. Instead, she was, she's making my final worth double so that my final counts for this test. And so other students wanted that to happen to them, too. I don't know why, because I don't like that. <laughs> but um, she said that the reason they felt comfortable even asking her is because she's a woman and that people think they can push her around. So I just want to know, how do we not let that happen? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that they would have easily asked that of a male professor just as, as much as they would a woman because they're trying to take advantage of the opportunity to either not have to take a test or get an extension. So it's it, to me, that says a lot more about the professor than it says certainly about you. And um, is she new? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that she is secretly conservative or do you know that she's liberal do you I mean, know I think she might be conservative that's yeah. why I'm worried she thinks right. it's because she's a woman right that's so interesting yeah. no I mean I, my experience is and I've heard stories met for many years from other um from other young women who have attended this that that is just as likely to happen to uh to a male professor as a female in fact what you might do is talk to some of the other women here who've had a similar experience um or find out from um, from Laurel or Camille, if they can put you in touch with somebody who's had a similar experience, because you might be able to go back to her and say, actually, I just met, you know, I was just spent time with a hundred young students and lots of other students have, you know, had a similar problem with a professor who was a man, not a woman. So you might find that experience right. and be able to share it with her. <laughs> Hi, um, this is a little bit of a random question, but um, I have a younger sister, she's 16, and she just kind of started getting into politics, mm -hmm. and she has like a Ronald Reagan poster in her room, but I don't know that she could like answer any questions regarding being a conservative. Mm -hmm. um, I've given her a couple books, but with her being 16, they're all right. over her head. Do you, off the top of your head, kind of know of a book that I could refer to like a teenager who maybe has more questions about being a conservative, right. even a conservative female. That is a great question because there are very few books that are written yeah. to a teenager level. I will say that probably one of the most valuable things she could do is attend a conference. Um, I know um, Claire Booth Luce has on occasion um, had events where high school kids can come. I know YAF has high school leadership uh, seminars. My, I think, oldest daughter went to a, high, a YAF high school event. And really, it may be that the best way for her to start to fill in the gaps and really understand what it means to be conservative is to is rather than reading a book is to go to um, to, to one of the high school leadership events. Yeah, the, the YAF events are great. I know my daughter really really enjoyed it. And you get a variety of speakers. You have other um, high school kids there too who can talk to you. And some of them are very very well informed. It might actually be easier to hear it from someone that's her same age and her peer. Than um, you know, than someone else. So I think that would be helpful. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to take a short break before we um, get started with our next panel. And I also just wanted to let you know that. Um, 
Amanda Owens, who's speaking on our next uh, panel, and she's with Future Female Leaders. She has a little table set up here with some things for sale and a free gift for all of you. So if you want to stop by during this break, you're welcome to. Thank you. But then I realized that